Uh, for those of you who don't normally come, my name is Dwayne. I run the Science Fiction Fantasy here. I try to run all the Science Fiction Fantasy events. Every spot for me. Yeah. My favorite ones this year was we had Kevin Hernan earlier, and he's on our YouTube page now, which is where Terry's piece is going to be today, too, later. And uh, I said to Kevin, I know I missed your event last year, and there's sure was a good reason, but I can't think what it was. And Kevin goes, yeah, you were off with Neil Gaiman. <laughs> uh, I'm like, yeah, that would probably do it. So we try not to do too much of that because it's not any fun if you guys can't see two authors at once. We'll get testing and we have trouble splitting me in half. It gets to be a problem. Uh, no, he wouldn't do that. I remember the first year I ever met Terry, he came in here and we're doing an event. I'm looking at the clock and I'm going, oh God, we're going to run out of time. I start doing this. And Terry looked over and said, stop that. <laughs> I'm going to leave at 3 o'clock or whatever it was. I'm going to stay to all my fans who have had a chance to say hello, get their book signed, so just chill. <laughs> Not every author does it that way. I've had authors come in here and leave on open time, so too bad. You've got to deal with those crazy angry people. That isn't the bookseller's favorite part of the day. So, I've learned a lot over the years from Terry. He's come here every year. So I, was, I occasionally decided that I'm just going to see if I didn't show up with Terry with a complaint, where the hell is he? <laughs> I don't if I'm here and he has to come too. So but uh, I look forward with anticipation to show because all the authors I can think of deserved a movie or a TV show all these years, you know, we waited for them to make uh, magic for sale sold. And it may still happen, in which case we'll all be happy. If I'm never gonna have Shannon around then we can all nitpick it. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll say it's not his fault. <laughs> In the meantime, we're here for the Darkling Child, and Terry keeps saying he's going to wrap up and quit writing the chat around, but well, who cares if he ever to pull it off? It's like my friend who keeps saying he's going to retire, and ten years later he's still traveling the world. Anyway, please welcome Terry Brooks. I appreciate the fact everybody made the effort to come out. Uh, not easy on the roads out there today. Um, I came from West Seattle and uh, the entire West Seattle Bridge was blocked and I could see all the way to the freeway which going north was blocked also. But uh, being a, a pro at getting off of West Seattle and I need to, I also noticed that uh, the, the viaduct was moving even though the sign said closed. So of course I just said, <laughs> 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 Well, I was going to show you a clip from uh, the TV show uh, for today, but, uh, you know, we have all these cameras that are telecasting hither and yon, and, of course, we can't allow this to be shown anywhere. So, sorry, guys. You'll, you'll, have, to, you'll have to blame the store and Sean for everything. That you <laughs> Not only now, but for the rest of the day. <laughs> So we're here uh, today uh, with Darkling Child, um, and because you made the effort, I will tell you something nobody else knows uh, about this, uh, this series, Defenders, and that is that the next book, uh, which I'm going to read to you from today, is called The Sorcerer's Daughter. Um, and as you may remember from book one, hopefully, the Sorcerer's Daughter is Leah for Rye, who uh, ends up attracted to, uh, and we think maybe there's a relationship budding between her and uh, whoever the main guy is, so I can't think of him right now, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, Pax and Lee. Uh, so uh, obviously this book is about uh, her in uh, large part, although not exclusively. Um, and I'm going to read to you today uh, uh, five short pages from that book. Uh, fairly early on in the book, uh, when we discover that uh, Leah Fur is on a rescue mission, I won't tell you who for, um, but she has persuaded herself she has to do this, even though there are a lot of good reasons she shouldn't even think about it. But she has joined forces uh, with a very strange individual who is a shapeshifter. And uh, in this particular book, we're going to get a very close look at what this means. And it's not as cool as perhaps Marvel Comics might lead you to think. There are real serious drawbacks to being a shapeshifter. 
but we find out early on um, that he is afflicted in ways that make it very difficult for him to exercise this particular form of magic. And he has agreed to go with Leofur uh, on this rescue mission because this gives him a chance to maybe salvage something that he has lost along the way. Um, and in this particular uh, situation uh, that I'm going to read to you from, he has just had uh, a near-death experience uh, due to the people that they are hunting trying to get rid of him. And so now that he has escaped that, he and Leifer are about to go in hunt of these very same people. And this is how it reads. They continued on to the airship with little conversation. Imrik asked again if she were all right, apparently worried that she had somehow been injured and was keeping it to herself. Perhaps, she thought, because that is what he would do. His life of secrecy had pretty well shaped his character, and what he knew to be true about himself, he probably saw frequently in others, whether it was there or not. He stumbled a bit as they went, and she could tell he was not completely back to himself. But he seemed to get stronger as they went, and by the time they had reached the two-man, he was fully recovered. All right, then, he said, turning to face her. Another changing is needed, which means we will have to tether again. I'm not sure exactly what's happened, and I won't know until we catch up with whoever made the two sets of footprints. I have to track them on the ground. You have to follow me in the airship. We can't afford to leave the airship behind. We will almost certainly need it again before this is over. Do you think we can catch up to Crystalyn today? How far ahead is she? He shook his head. Can't be sure it's Crystalyn. We're tracking. Although, he added hastily, I can't imagine it isn't. More to the point, I don't know the nature or identity of the quarry we're chasing. At least one of them is pretty clever with explosives and traps, so I have to be prepared for the worst. I'm choosing a form that allows for that. Quarry, she thought. What form will you take? That's what I want to talk to you about. I need something that possesses both tracking and defensive skills. A big, strong creature to run and evade, one with stamina and heart, a predator. I will change into a parsk wolf. She recognized the name. These were big, powerful animals from the deep eastland, fierce enough to stand against a coden. They were named for the region that had birthed them the Parsk Valley, deep inside the rock spur near the no north near the high bends. She had never seen one, but she had heard stories about how dangerous they were. You know of them, he asked, seeing the look on her face. Well, then you understand how I see the situation. There is no better combination of tracker and fighter, no creature more <coughs> suited to what we require than a Parsk wolf. But it's not a perfect choice. Parsk wolves are unpredictable creatures. I have to be wary about losing control once I change. Its temperament and emotional instability may be too much for me. So you will need to keep close watch and bring me back at once if you sense anything at all going wrong. Not to question your judgment, but what if you're wrong about this? What if it turns out you can't control yourself once you change? What if I'm not strong enough to save you? He cocked an eyebrow. But you are. I wouldn't be doing this otherwise. So now that you know what's going to happen, let's get on with it. We have to cover as much ground as possible before it gets dark. Without waiting for her response, he stripped off his clothes once more and stowed them in the pilot box. Then he stepped away. Climb back into the two-man and lift off. Once you're away, I'll make the change. No sense in taking chances. Eric, no, don't. But he waved her off his features stiff and forbidding, his posture a clear indication that he was not interested in hearing further objections. She retreated to the airship, climbed into the pilot box, engaged the controls, and powered up the parse tubes. Seconds later, she was airborne, hovering 30 feet above him, watching warily as he prepared himself. He was standing there in the sunlight, scratched and bruised, but somehow looking heroic, his, uh, his willingness to put himself in peril admirable, if not necessarily wise. He clearly understood that this change carried special risk. To achieve what was needed to find Chrysalin, he was willing to gamble. Or perhaps, she thought suddenly, he was actually eager for it. Without understanding why, she knew even as she completed the thought that she was right. This shape-shifting experience was entirely different than the last. Before, it had been a gradual, unhurried evolution as he changed from human to animal. 
Now it was more like an explosive reimagining. The muscles of his body rippled with an expansion of raw power, extrusions and disconnections ripping at him, bones and flesh and blood all reforming in a whirlwind of pulsing fury. The Parsquolf came alive in mere seconds. It surfaced with a vengeance, came into being as if desperate for life, as if escaping a cage. Leifer, linked by the tethering, was at the center of the changing. She was infused with a strong sense of the Parsquolf's predatory nature and savage instincts. She could feel its hunger, its urge to hunt, its willingness to kill. Its lean, muscular shape was a more proper fit for Imric's human form than the ferrets had been. Its formidable nature made it a suitable match for Imric's own. She sensed the comfort he experienced in his body. She sensed that this was a creature he knew intimately, one with which he instinctively bonded. In every way that mattered, he was the Parsquolf. He was down on all fours now, the wolf form complete. His broad, shaggy head swung from side to side, gimlet eyes searching. He circled in a crouch, sniffed the ground, and began loping back along the path Emmerich had taken earlier to where the tracks of the crashed airship's occupants began. Watching him with a mix of excitement and horror, disturbed by his size and look and clear desire to hunt, Leofer followed. Engaging the airship thruster, she cruised along behind him, staying safely overhead. When they reached the tracks, the Parsquolf began sniffing around, moving from place to place. Its huge, grizzled head lowered so close to the ground that at times its nose was pressed right up against the earth it searched. Leifer's own senses were filled with what the wolf was finding, smells that were raw and dark. Its eager response felt threatening, exuding menace and a potential for explosiveness, the promise of unleashing its raw, destructive power only a heartbeat away. Leifer was already sorry she had agreed to this. She understood the danger Emmerich was facing, but she was convinced he should have chosen a less lethal form. Still, it was too late for second guessing. The wolf had picked up the trail and was trotting ahead through the brush and trees at a steady pace, all grace and power and dark intent. Stay with me. Keep me in sight. The lure of this form is very strong, Leifer. I am hungry for the feel of it. It infuses me with such pleasure. Shades, he was already succumbing. Emmerich, stop there. This is too much for you. Change back. Find another form. Her plea went unanswered. She tried again, and his vision cut away from her, the link broken. She tracked him as best she could, all the while trying to reestablish visual contact and never finding him ready to allow for it. She lost him eventually, found him again in a flash of black and gray fur for a matter of seconds, and then he disappeared for good. She flew on, doing her best to hold her course, to keep to where she thought he had gone, but blind for all intents and purposes to his progress. She could not shed the sinking feeling in her stomach. She could not help but believe she had seen the last of him. This whole plan had been flawed from the start, weighted too much in his favor and too little in hers. He had used her. How? She was uncertain, but the feeling was there. The afternoon slipped into evening, twilight a deep, rich purple as the sun slid below the horizon, and darkness settled in. By midnight, the sky was filled with stars, and the forest below and the mountains to her left made bright with their silvery light. She had just arrived at the deep, broad cut of the Kennan Pass, when from out of the dark reaches, disembodied and terrible, she heard his voice once more. I have them. And he does, too. <laughs> okay, well, this particular book will be out a year from now, give or take a few weeks. Um, and that will conclude this particular cycle, and it's a setup, actually, for... Uh, the last three books that I'm writing in this series, uh, well, it's not the last two books. Let me rephrase that. I keep saying that. <laughs> the three books that will conclude the, uh, the Shannara series, uh, so that I don't have to worry about someone else writing it. I've said this before. I'm saying it again. I don't want someone else writing it when I'm dead. Thanks. So I'm writing it now, and then uh, after I do that, um, I will go back into uh, 
uh, back into this world from time to time and write some additional books. I've finished the uh, prehistory. You might have noticed that. A few of you have commented on it from time to time, like, what the? Uh huh. So, uh, anyway, um, I will. I'll get to it. You know, I'm not that old. Uh, Peter Dunn, and uh, eventually I'll get back to it. At the moment, I'm inundated with uh, obligations for this TV show, so that's eating up a lot of my time. So, now, uh, as a special treat, I hope. And because we have time, I'm going to read you something else. Um, this is uh, this is this is for Sean. This is a promo for Sean. So let's all all keep an eye on his face as I talk about this. He's, he's doing a, a book called Unfettered Two. But some of you may have read Unfettered One. Um, and uh, I pawned an old story off on him. You may have noticed uh, in Unfettered One that had been published back in the early 90s because uh, I was too lazy to write something new at the time or too inundated with other work, take your choice. This time I've written him an original piece of fiction, and uh, uh, it is a Magic Kingdom story. Uh, so I'm going to read to you a uh, truncated, uh, reduced version of the first seven pages of this, uh, which goes along pretty quickly, and it's self-explanatory, um, just to give you a taste of what I'm putting into this uh, compilation, which I venture to say might not be like anybody else's. I won't even give you the title, I'll just read it to you. On that late spring morning, it wasn't the weather that ended up ruining Ben Holiday's day. No, on that morning, it was an unexpected visit. Hi, Lord. A tinny voice called out from the other side of his closed bedroom door. His eyes opened and he lifted his head from the pillow. That voice sounded familiar and not in a good way. No, instead it nudged to life rather aggressively a recognizable clutch of dark memories that had been buried, if never quite eradicated, by the passing of the days. Is he in there? A second voice whispered, similar in tone, but just different enough to be distinguishable. He must be. He sleeps in there, doesn't he? Well, he might have gone out. Where would he go? Anywhere he chooses. He is High Lord. Ah, Ben thought in dismay. The light dawned. Go away, he shouted at the door. Far, far away. Gasp sounded. Breath exhaled in a mix of distress and awe. A jumbled muttering of indistinguishable words ensued. A shuffling of feet preceded the sound of bodies crowding up against the door in an effort to get closer. Great High Lord, cried one voice. Mighty High Lord, cried the other. Philip and Sot. If not his worst nightmare, then something close. He squeezed his eyes tightly closed in disbelief. How had they gotten in here? Weren't there supposed to be guards protecting him from intruders? Wasn't he safe even in his own bed? Go away, he repeated. Philip and Sot. Troublesome even for Gahom gnomes, a variety of Landoverian gnomes that were otherwise mostly innocuous. Most gnomes, the good kind, nested in the northern stretches of Landover, up around the Melkor Mountains, where they behaved themselves, where they didn't eat their neighbor's pets, where they didn't steal everything that wasn't nailed down, where they didn't start fires in people's living rooms just to see what would happen, all of which the home gnomes did without a second thought. This was a tribe so reviled by everyone that they had been told so often to go home gnomes that the name had stuck. Unfortunately, no one, themselves included, could remember by now where that home was or how to get the Gahome gnomes back there. <laughs> Great High Lord, they called out through the door, chanting together, Mighty High Lord, on and on and on. <laughs> he gritted his teeth. His thoughts were best left unvoiced, so he kept them that way. Instead, he climbed out of bed to meet his fate, already pretty much knowing what it was. Not in the specific, of course, but generally. Each appearance by these two always prefaced, prefaced a disaster. Only the nature of it varied. He yanked open the door furiously. Two wizened, somewhat monkey-like faces stared up at him in adoration from three feet down. Eyes wide and adoring, beaming smiles revealing sharpened teeth, they bowed low. Great High Lord, mighty High Lord. Stop saying that, he snapped, causing him to flinch. How did you get in here anyway? Oh. It was easy, High Lord, Philip explained. We just climbed the wall. You climbed the... Wait, that wall is a hundred feet high. They wouldn't let us skin through the gates, High Lord. They sent us away. They would not tell you where we, where we were here. So we climbed. It's very easy for gnomes to climb walls. 
Note to self, Ben thought, find a way to make castle walls too slick to climb. <laughs> what about the guards? Didn't they see you? The gnomes looked at each other in confusion. Hey, it was very dark. No one could see us. Ben stared. You climbed the wall last night? It was necessary, High Lord, Philip said. Sot nodded eagerly. We have a problem, High Lord. We need you to solve it. We couldn't wait until morning, Philip added. Not out there, Sot declared, gesturing vaguely. So we climbed the wall and waited outside your door. Ben pictured this and was appalled, but only for a second because it was so typically them it didn't bear dwelling on them. We have a problem, Sot repeated. We do, Philip agreed. Of course you do, Ben made a dismissive gesture. When have you not had a problem? But you have to go through the gates and the front door and ask to see me. You do not get to see me by climbing walls and sneaking around to find my bedroom door and waiting for morning to barge in uninvited and waking me up. I was sleeping. Both gnomes nodded sagely. We slept a little too, Philip announced, <laughs> missing the point entirely. Can we tell you about our problem now? Ben gave up. Sure, why not? Come right in. No need to stand on ceremony. Mi casa es su casa. Feel free to make yourselves at home. He stomped back into his bedroom and threw himself down on the bed. The gnomes took this as an invitation and jumped up beside him. <laughs> ben was too worn down to do anything about it. He did have enough presence of mind to wonder where Willow was. She had been there last night, hadn't she? Usually that meant she was there in the morning. But for some reason she wasn't today. Probably heard the gnomes outside the door and was smart enough to get out while the getting was good. Still, it was strange. He hadn't heard her go. <coughs> We have a new pet, Philip began, and right away Ben held up his hand. Don't tell me you ate it. <laughs> no, no, it's my pet. When has that ever stopped you? It is a special pet, Philip announced. A special pet, Sot echoed. I found it, Philip added. Sort of, Sot said. They looked at him, waiting. So what's the problem, he asked cautiously. My pet was stolen, Philip announced, a frown adding further displacement to his wizened features. Sort of, Philip repeated. There was a nuance to these last two words that Ben didn't miss. Stolen or not, he pressed none too gently. Time was wasting. Philip was looking daggers at Sot. It was my pet, he snapped. You both found it, Sot replied. It was mine. It was his too. Wait a minute, Ben interrupted. Someone else was with you when you found it? Philip made a freshly reworked expression of disgust by clearing his throat loudly. <laughs> Shoot, Diesel. Another go home gnome that was always making unfortunate decisions and wreaking havoc as a result. Miss Staya, his daughter, had encountered this one after her discharge from Carrington, but it was Ben, still in Landover, who was now stuck with him. Still, unlike Philip and Sot, Shoop Diesel never spoke. As far as Ben was concerned, it was his sole virtue. Ben rubbed his eyes wearily, wishing he were back asleep. So you and Shoop Diesel found this pet together. He is my pet, Philip declared vehemently. I want him back. It was at this point that the bedroom door opened and Willow walked in. His wife took in the sight of her husband, sitting in bed with a pair of the home gnomes and raised an eyebrow. This isn't what it seems, Ben said quietly. <laughs> Willow, ever calm and steady, nodded. Is this about the pet? Ben stared. Well, who knew? <laughs>
Ironically, unremembered. Unremembered. <laughs> know right now, if you're not there yet, you wait till you get to 71. <laughs> You'll find that all those things you just took for granted start to slip, 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 slide away. So anyway, uh, I was going to say, uh, Peter is a good writer, by the way, local, lives here in Seattle. Uh, he's working hard to get free of Microsoft, so help him out. Uh, so at any rate, um, I was going to say, before we get into uh, Unremembered and now uh, Trial of Intentions, that yesterday uh, they finished shooting um, the Shannara TV show, uh, and I'm told that that definitely is done because I had said maybe we could reshoot this. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they all say goodbye to each other, and they're, they're all moving on towards Comic Con in uh, in San Diego. And at Comic Con in San Diego, they will announce uh, what the release date is. And do not bother. I do not know. They aren't telling me either, so um, I am not sure. Uh, exactly when it will be. Um, I can tell you about this show that I have vetted with the writers every single episode from beginning to end multiple times. I have reviewed the rough cuts of each episode multiple times <laughs> and I'm about at the point where if I hear anything more about this thing I'm gonna scream and run away. No, it's not that bad, but it, uh, what I really want to say is that uh, what I see is very good. Um, I think that they've done a terrific job with it. Um, I gave them uh, my opinion at the beginning of the relationship that it would be a good idea for them not to feel constrained by what was in the book. If they wanted to write something new and different, that would make it a new experience for those of you who know the book. I still believe that is true. That was what I learned from George Lucas when I wrote uh, The uh, Phantom Menace. Uh, a little freedom goes a long way, and uh, they've used it well, and they have some very interesting twists. Uh, some of them you will not see coming, and I think they're extremely cool. They've kept the bones of the book together very nicely. Uh, they have not uh, destroyed the characters or done anything, you know, that's going to make you say, oh, well, let's just take him out and hang him from the nearest limb. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm quite sure you will be. Um, I particularly like the first episode, which I think is, is compelling and interesting. And they have six, ep six reworks later, boy, they got it down. It's, it's darn good, if I do say so myself. But I didn't have anything to do with it, so. Um, so that's my story about that. Uh, I guess that's all I have to say about that. I guess the uh, cast and crew are going to be in San Diego, some of them anyway, uh, and doing some a panel. Uh, so for anybody who happens to be going there, um, my schedule is kind of like this. I'll be there uh, for three or four days. I'll be at Gen Con. If, for those of you who know what Gen Con is, it's a big gaming. Uh, convention held, or the biggest gaming convention actually, held in uh, Indianapolis uh, the end of uh, July, beginning of August. My grandson and I are going to go. He will go as a gamer, I will go as somebody who's confused. <laughs> uh, it was suggested by my family today that it's a really good thing I'm taking him with me because that way I won't get lost. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, but um, that, that should be very interesting. Um, going to be there as author guest of honor. Um, I will be at uh, Salt Lake City Comic Con in the uh, last third week of uh, September. I will be at New York Comic Con uh, in mid-October. And that's about enough cons, I would say, wouldn't you? Um, and then after that, I better go back to work and, and start getting that first book ready for 2017. So I'll be doing that. And uh, then, like the rest of you, I'll be waiting to see how the TV show plays out. Um, so other than that, um, what else can I tell you? That I, anybody got any questions? Well, yes, sir. I remember that Alfred uh, Hitchcock used to have brief appearances in his movies. Would we look for you in a similar kind of arrangement with your movie? <laughs> this, is, this is a question being asked by somebody who knows me well. <laughs> Which I like. No. <laughs> Do I look like Stan Lee to you? <laughs> 
Uh, you know, no, actually, uh, I, I, I might have succumbed to the idea, but nobody's ever suggested it. Perhaps they recognize the value of, of my services and also the weaknesses as well. They decided, let's keep him off to the side for as long as we can anyway. Um, so no, I will not be involved in uh, appearing on screen. Maybe in another season it'll seem like a good idea, but it never seemed like a particularly good idea. So no. Yes. Uh, so what is their plan? I mean, I'm assuming they have some sort of long-term plan with it in terms of, like, assuming that it's successful and they continue on. It, does it go the entire length of Elfstones and then stops? or, or And are they, are they going to do like Game of Thrones where they kind of continue on in some fashion towards the books? Or, I mean, you want to know how many objectionable scenes you're going no, to no, see? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. None. I'm just curious where they're going with it. Uh, yeah, um, well... Uh, I think it's been uh, put out there before that the first season is all of Elfstones. Uh, so uh, what is essentially 10 episodes uh, will cover the entire story. Uh, beyond that, uh, it's not been decided for sure, and uh, there's still some discussions going on about that by all the parties involved about what will work. Um, I think right now they're waiting to see if there will be a season two. If nobody watches this thing, then that's the end of that, isn't right. it? But uh, hopefully you'll all tune in, and um, so will others, and uh, so will the MTV audience and whatever. Um, and everybody will like it well enough that they'll run the numbers up that they'll want to do season two. They seem pretty confident that they'll do season two. Uh, I do have no clue about these things, so I couldn't tell you. But uh, after that, uh, there are the you know there's a lot, lot, lot of possibilities. There are 25 books. Mm. 25 seasons. I kind of like the idea. <laughs> Uh, I think they'll they'll you know make a judgment call on that when they get to that point, and uh, when I know, you will know. Believe me. That's it. Yes, ma'am. Um, so outside of the Shamrock series and the TV series, are you working on any other? Outside of Shamrock, am I doing anything else? Sometimes it doesn't seem like it. <laughs> uh, but yes, I am. Uh, I am writing some other things, as you know and playing around with what to do about, about those, and that's all I want to say about that. Uh, I uh, still have Magic Kingdom for sale uh, under option at Warner Brothers with Steve Carell still latched, attached to it. We have a new writer, I think, although I haven't gotten confirmation about that. I have to fly down and meet the new writer and have one of those come to Jesus moments with him, uh, whoever it is. Uh, and uh, they seem to be fairly well committed. I, I can't believe they're still hanging on to this because, you know, it's been years. Uh, but, and they've spent, they've cost them a lot of money to do this, but they're, apparently Steve Carell wants to do it and they want to do it, so, and I'd like to see him do it, so I'm hopeful, ever hopeful, uh, that Magic Kingdom will yet see its way onto the uh, silver screen and uh, it will turn out to be, turn out to be decent, so that would be good. Yes, sir. Uh, maybe I missed the news at all, but I didn't see who was playing King of the Silver River. I mean, are you sure you don't want that role? <laughs> <laughs> As I recall, the King of the Silver River is like thousands of years old. <laughs> and has magical powers beyond mine. Uh, uh, yeah, well, you'll have to wait and see. Oh. <laughs> yes, sir. With the uh, new Star Wars movies coming out, any chance you're getting involved with the Star Wars again? No, um, Star Wars. Will I do anything with <coughs> Star Wars? No. I have said I said from the beginning I got to do number one in the chronologically, so that was all I really wanted to do in the first place anyway. Um, and there, there's no much, not a lot of reason to do it more than once, not for me anyway. So no, there's, there's, I would say, zero chance that I will be involved in it. But the minute I say that, you watch. Uh, I think that uh, there are plenty of other people that can do that job just fine. And um, I'm so wrapped up in other things right now that I would say no. I'm just hoping it's good. Uh, like everybody, right? Please. You know. uh, but uh, we'll have to see if... Um, is it, who's the who's the director on the Josh Whedon? Josh Whedon? Abrams. Which Abrams. 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 That's right. So who knows? He's got a record. It should be good. Yes, sir. Um, will we see more of Warden Void, whether in television or print or? 
Well, word and void, yeah. Word and void is a bit of a tricky matter at this point uh, as to what to do with it. Um, and frankly, I'm, I, I want to sit on that a while longer. I think at some point, yes, we will definitely do something with it. Uh, there's a question about which direction it might go. Uh, to a certain extent, it will depend on what happens with the first season of The Shannara Show as to what I decide I want to do with it. I still have those rights, and I'm hanging on to them with an iron fist. Um, so I think, um, you know, the first thing that happens when you sell something like, like Shannara, you know, and, and, and it gets... Then it's, uh, well, what, el what else you got? You know, what else can we see? Uh, show us something else. But sometimes it's, it's better to just sit and wait a while and, and see how it goes. So that's what I'm doing. Cemetery Dance actually has a limited edition that they oh. just put up for sale like three days ago. And it's a gorgeous book from what I can tell. So definitely visit Cemetery Press. Yeah. Wait a minute. I just stole your thunder. It's on. No, no. I'm glad you reminded me, but I'd forgotten about it because I hadn't heard one word about this. And it's on sale. I don't have a copy. <laughs> All right, so here we are. I don't have a copy of that. I don't have a copy of my own book. I don't. I don't have one. I have an English version. That's what I have. I'm telling you. I'm getting disrespected all over the place. <laughs> I guess they'll get around to Sonic sending something at some point. Yes, ma'am. So, a uh, little bit of an unspecific question, you know, not specific to the Shannara series. What advice would you give to writers who are looking to get published? <laughs> You know, whenever I hear that question, what advice would I give to writers learning to get published? I always think, how much time do I have here? Mm. Uh, you know, I, I just, the, the landscape has changed considerably from when I was in there. To me, it seems that the, there are more avenues open now to, to young writers uh, looking, or new writers trying to break in because of the online publishing opportunities um, that weren't in existence back in the 70s, if you uh, so you don't have to go the traditional route anymore. Uh, you can actually put yourself out there in other ways. Uh, your ability to reach people is much easier now than it used to be. That's good, but of course the competition is, is pretty severe too. So I, I just think that the advice I, I was given years ago is still the best advice, which is, first of all, write something good. Better yet, write something great. You know, write the best thing you can write, something you just love. And if you don't write something you really love, then go on and write something else until you do get there. Because uh, once you've written something really good, it, you can find a home for it much more easily than if it's something mediocre. And right now, the biggest drawback to being a writer in our field is that everybody's writing in our field. It's like, you know, telling the weather, for crying out loud. Everybody's got an opinion about how this ought to be done, and everybody's got a book of fantasy hanging fire. So, uh, and we're now competing against young adult, which was an unknown, practically, or an anathema back in, the, uh, back in the 70s. Nobody wanted to be young adult. Well, guess what? Now, everybody would like to publish in young adult because, you know, that's what's getting all the traction with movies and games and everything else under the sun. And there's some great writers working at this, not to diminish those writers, because some of them are truly wonderful. And uh, you have to sort, sort through a bit. And sometimes the ones that get the most press aren't the best. But in any case, there a lot of that's being done, and, and you know, the huge sections of the bookstores are being uh, occupied by writers uh, of um, adult or young adult. You know, I use that young adult, and I think, what does that mean exactly? Because a lot of young adult is extremely adult. Uh, I can give you some examples, but I don't think I should because there are young ears present here. Uh, but uh, some of that, it, it's hard to, you know, there's no, no clear line anymore between one and the other, except uh, sometimes they're a little bit shorter, but even that's not true. So there you go. So persevere, write something good. That's what everybody should do that wants to do this thing. Yes, sir. Of all the books that you've written, what would you consider is your uh, uh, most fulfilling writing experience? What is my most fulfilling writing experience? Well, that's a question. Um, I suppose, uh, I suppose uh, Running with the Demon was my most fulfilling because uh, that was a book that I took a long time thinking about it, thinking about what I wanted to do. It took a while to come together, and then I wrote it, and I just wrote it right from front to back, no slowing down. I knew that book. I still know that book as well as, as I know my own life. And uh, I really felt I accomplished exactly what I wanted to accomplish in that book. 
There's some others like Elfstones and so forth that I thought which required more effort, but that came out really well and I was happy with. There's probably a half a dozen, eight of those out there too. But uh, I, I'd probably, probably that book. Okay, a couple more and then we'll quit. Yes, ma'am. I'm from Sterling, Illinois. No. Yeah. <laughs> from permanently or just visiting? I've been raised there. Yeah, okay. Park. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, but you're so young. So what would you say? Is it true that you could be channeled by the characters that you have created? Uh, can I be channeled by the characters I created? Uh, well, I, I think it's true, uh, for me at least, that there's a bit of me in all my characters. That's good or bad and indifferent. Uh, I think you put yourself in there, you know, your thinking and your emotional makeup all goes into the characters you create. So yeah, there's definitely some of that that, that goes in there. Um, I'm not one of those writers that uh, believes that your characters take over the story. Uh, we don't. I slap them right down when they try that. <laughs> I, I feel like you you're in charge and you tell them where they need to go and they will let you know if they're happy with it or not by you know you you get writer's block. You know what the problem is. So for me, uh, yeah, there's that definitely that connection. When I'm in the story, I'm really in the story until I'm done with it and then it's kind of you know goodbye. I'm, I'm moving on to the next thing because I, the process has always been the thing I really loved. Still do. The process is everything for me. Okay, maybe one more. Yes, sir. Will your series be broadcast in Europe by any chance? Will it be shown in Europe? Yes. Are you from there? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting warmer. Keep guessing. Okay. It's nearer to Saudi Europe. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, it will be, as a matter of fact. Right. It's already sold in a number of countries. I think that their intention is to sell it everywhere there's fantasy. Um, the major European countries will definitely all carry it because they already bought it. They're stuck. Um, and I, I suspect it will find its way through, you know, because my books are in 40-some countries, so I think, yeah. I think we can expect it to uh, crop up more than one place. Okay. Oh, i got to take this question. Yes, sir. So you mentioned Marvel earlier. Um, are you into the Marvel Universe? And if you are, what would you say would be your favorite character? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Is this actually being televised live? <laughs> Yeah, am I into the Marvel Universe? Uh, I grew up re reading Marvel comics, actually. So there you go. I used to collect them in the old days, and then somebody stole my whole collection while I was away at school. Oh. I know. I had a Spider-Man number one. Oh. oh, wow. Others in the mint condition. Wow. That was my retirement, and so now I have to write. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, gosh, who is my favorite character? Uh, that's pretty tough. I like a lot of them. I guess I, I probably I probably like Spider-Man as much as anybody, and the reason I, I do is because he feels real to me as a, as a character. He's very conflicted. I believe that people in general are conflicted in their lives and beset by doubts about themselves and their abilities. Um, I think that uh, he shares with me, Spider-Man does, Peter Parker does, a question about what the responsibility is to your fellow man and uh, how much of yourself you have to put out there uh, when it's dangerous. Not me personally, the characters I read about. They're starting to look at me funny, I'm like, you're in danger? No, no not a bit. Um, so I, I, think, I think I would choose him, although there's, there's a, lot of, a lot to be said for some of the others. Uh, I do kind of think that uh, Marvel's gotten carried away with themselves with the movies, though, I will tell you that. Yeah. I mean, Ant-Man? <laughs> that, they discontinued that years ago for Grand Bob, so I'm not sure. They're dredging the bottom of the barrel now. But we'll see. It'll probably do great. Every time I say this, that goes on to you know be a huge success, so I'll be wrong again. So I'll just tell you thanks again for coming. Um, I will, of course, be back here as always, as Dwayne has already said, uh, with the next book that comes out. Um, you know, if the Cemetery Press book shows up at some point, as, as apparently it will, maybe I'll come in and sign some of those just for fun. For those few people that can afford the car. Anybody know what it sells for? $50 and $200. Well, it is illustrated, so I guess that, you know, it's a specialty coffee table book. So those of you who really love it, or collectors, I guess you might want that. Okay.
So anyway, uh, I just want to thank you all for coming again and tell you how much I appreciate your support. I am very hopeful that you will love the TV show. I do feel strongly that you will. Um, and I have, uh, you know, I always say the same thing uh, over the years about uh, what, what writers say about movies and TV shows. Uh, having your book made into a movie slash TV show is like having your child kidnapped by a cult. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not mine, that's another writer that said that. But I, I will say, in this instance, that is not how I feel about it. I don't feel that way at all. I feel like it has been well done and um, it will find an audience and you will not be ready to lynch me from the nearest tree when you see what they've done with, with, with the show. Like Thanks. Yep. No, that's not what it's called. Uh, is that Chronicles. Chronicles. All right. It's, yeah, Shannara Chronicles. It's called the Shannara Chronicles, and that is because only the first season is Elfstones. So you know, it gets a little goofy if you call it that, and then the next season it's doing something else. So they're going with the Shannara Chronicles, and I feel fine with that. <laughs> okay, no, it's Shannara. Why would it be true? Because it's all your fault. <laughs> it is not my fault. I say Shannara. However, when I first, the writer said, well, we're going to work on the Shannara conference. I said, well, first of all, you got the name wrong. It's Shannara. And they said, what do your fans call it? <laughs> I said, well, they said, that's the majority call it Shannara, don't they? And I, they said, that's good enough for us, that's it. <laughs> so, you know, again, you got to go with the majority, so you know, we all got to make another adjustment. But I will continue to refer to it in my own dialect, in my own pronunciation, and they will do it the way they want to do it. And remember the book and the movie. When you're holding the book, you say, Shannara. When you're watching the movie, you can say, you know, the other way. <laughs> Thank you very much.